Good evening, this is Social Work 636, and in week two, we are introduced to the concept of organizational structures. The various models of organizational structure are examined, and the types of auspice, nonprofit, for profit, and government are explored. The learning objectives for this week are to define that legal auspice to describe the concept of organizational structure and to define the components of the structure. So let's go to the learning materials for this week. There are several readings and I'll talk briefly about some of the concepts from those readings. So there's the Cornell University Legal Informational Institute reading on nonprofit organizations, a chapter by Steve Kaufman in the book called Strengths Based Generalist Practice, a Collaborative Approach, an article by Ko and Lu on the transformation from traditional nonprofit organizations to social enterprises, and an additional article by Lockhart. The media for this week are the, the lecture slides, but you will find that those slides are the same as the ones from the first week. At least this one uh, group of slides we already covered in week two, so I will not cover uh, week one, so I will not cover that again. But there are two very interesting videos, one by Noam Chomsky on privatization and another by Don Pallotta who talks very specifically about why nonprofits will never be able to solve the world's problems because they are treated so different from for-profits and we'll talk a little bit about some of those concepts. There is also some additional supplemental material if you have the time to go ahead and read some additional information. For this week, the assignment for week two is as follows. You all have seen the Widener Share uh, social work case. So this is the case of Anita and her family. So for your initial post, you will answer the following questions. In a perfect world, identify at least three critical services that should be available to Anita and to her children. Now, thinking about the organization she would have to interact with to have these services provided, what kinds of barriers, problems might she confront as she attempts to interact with these services? For example, don't use this example, but Think of the problem of distance or transportation, for example. Finally, what can organizations do to help her transcend those barriers? Identify at least one possible solution that may be implement, implemented for each identified problem. Again, thinking of the problem, something like a bus voucher might be of use. And then there's extra points if you bring in an example of a is not an exhaustive overview so some of the readings i do not touch upon you will need to take a look at all of the readings do do a complete and thorough reading of all the readings for this week to get a full picture but i have pulled out a few of the concepts for this week and the first is that organizations are made up of groups of people and that organizations are true systems that are responsible to their constituent groups, both internal and external. So organizations are not just a building. They are made up of groups of people and they have constituents to which they are responsible. Understanding organizations and being able to function well in organizations requires many of the same skills as those to make one successful in working with individuals, families, and small groups. Some of the concepts outlined in the Kaufman chapter in particular are of pre-engagement, 
assessment. What is the organization's identity? We talked last week about profit versus nonprofit. Some of the internal considerations or processes like the bylaws, the policies and procedures, the vision, mission, goals, and objectives of an organization. What does the leadership of this organization look like? There are many different types of leaders and hopefully we will have an opportunity to explore more about leadership during the, the, this course. External considerations. It's often called a SWOT analysis. So what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats or challenges to this organization? And what is its future vision or its strategic plan? And then organizations should be engaged in continuous improvement through evaluation. Other considerations outlined in the reading, should nonprofits become social enterprise through, enterprises through the development of commercial revenue streams? This is coming up a lot in the nonprofit sector right now. Cheney University, for example, has leased many of its buildings to outside commercial enterprises, and it's been criticized for that. I just saw a article with the state system and it's partnering with some of the tech industry to offer tech certificates to students. And so this is exploring other revenue streams with, um, but the organizations are nonprofit based. And what does that do to the organization? Noam Chomsky, poses the question about privatization. And so we hear a lot about privatization of organizations, organizations such as schools or prisons or even programs like Social Security. But if the government takes, if the government no longer is responsible for, the, for those programs, is this better for people or does it wind up costing us much more money in the long run with less services but the individuals that it was supposed to help do not get more services, but there are people who get rich in the process. And this is the concept talked about by Noam Chomsky. The video by Dan Pallotta is quite interesting and looks at the state of charitable organizations in the United States and what is happening to those organizations. The model that we use, will we ever be able to provide enough services? Will we ever be able to solve the problems that we're trying to solve because we're looking at a model that makes nonprofits successful? Uh, unsuccessful. One area, five areas that he specifically talks about are compensation. Why do we pay nonprofit CEOs so little versus the private sector? We expect CEOs in the nonprofit world to do it because of a sense of altruism, but if we want to attract the best and the brightest minds, we should be paying the same amounts of money that we pay the for-profit sector. Advertising, we don't want nonprofits to spend a lot of money on advertising. We want them to do low budget kind of um, notices on web pages or send out flyers. But if we really want them to raise the kind of money that we're saying we want them to raise, then why can't they spend more on an advertising budget? We restrict nonprofits from taking risks in order that they could pursue new ideas and new revenue streams. So we want nonprofits to, to play it safe. But as Pilata says, there is learning in failure. And just because something fails does not mean in the long run that the organization won't be successful. We don't provide nonprofits enough time to do anything we would be willing to allow 
at Amazon, for example, not to uh, invest its profits for a number of years and and certain things, but we would not allow a nonprofit to say that, well, you know, for so many years, we're not going to increase services, we're going to hold the line, we're not going to do certain things. We expect the nonprofit to do a whole lot with very little in a very short period of time. And we don't allow nonprofits to use profits to attract any kind of capital that might be seen as a risk. And again, nonprofits have to invest their money back in providing services for the general public, but we don't allow them to take those profits and maybe explore other kinds of revenue streams. So it's an idea, it's food for thought about his feeling as to why nonprofits will never reach the goals that they attempt to, to reach for the benefit of the clients that they are trying to serve. And the last slide is the different readings that this PowerPoint used to, um, PowerPoint was drawn from. So again, this is week two. You have the assignment for this week. If you have any questions, please email me as soon as possible. And I will um, answer those questions as quickly as I can. I look forward to reading your assignments and have a wonderful week.